here we are, uh, another class uh, in Leviticus, Leviticus uh, for Beginners, Training for Holiness. Uh, this is lesson number 12 in this series. And uh, the uh, title of this lesson, Keeping the Moral and Spiritual Laws. Uh, Lord willing, we'll be covering uh, lesson uh, 17, or rather chapter 17 to chapter 20. Uh, verse 27. So we begin the second major part of the book of Leviticus. I mentioned that the first part contained instructions on how to obtain holiness, and one obtained holiness through the offerings and sacrifices at the tabernacle. Uh, one obtained holiness by having a consecrated priesthood presenting those offerings of the people directly to God in a holy place, which was the tabernacle complex. One attained holiness by distinguishing between clean and unclean, and also by observing the Day of Atonement each year. The second part of the book, which begins in chapter 17, provides people or provides the people with instructions about how one stays or maintains this personal holiness. The first section of the second part deals with uh, one's personal responsibility to keep the moral and the spiritual laws given by God, and they're listed in uh, chapter 17 to 20. A lot of lists you're going to find as we finish up the series here, there are a lot of lists that are given. So the first section, chapter 17, deals with issues related to blood, the sanctity, the importance of blood. And we read in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. And so since blood played such an important role in the sacrificial system, which in turn was used by God to sanctify His people, it's only logical that uh, it be the first topic to consider when reviewing various laws and regulations that help the people maintain their holy status um, uh, before, uh, before God. Uh, so we begin with the rules, first rule, only domestic animals were to be killed as sacrifices. Leviticus 17, one to nine. No animal was to be killed or sacrificed for food by any Israelite except at the tabernacle. Slaughtering an animal for food without sacrificing it was forbidden. Note that they had, a, um, they had a manna to eat and they rarely ate meat since animals were so valuable and they were needed to begin their breeding when they would arrive at the uh, at the promised land. People ask all the time, why didn't they just eat their animals? Well, well they, they, they didn't have that many and they didn't want to use them all up before they got to the uh, promised land. And plus, the animals are necessary for uh, the purpose of sacrifice. The main purpose of this rule of a blood uh, and uh, the killing of animals was to centralize worship at the tabernacle and to stop the pagan practice of sacrificing animals to pagan gods in open fields. Each territory, during that time, each territory had its local gods and people would offer sacrifices to appease these deities as they traveled from place to place. One of the first things that the Jews had to learn was that God, the true God, was everywhere. It, he, it wasn't a different God as you went from place to place. God was God and He was with you and He was there wherever you were. The Jews had God dwelling among them within the tabernacle and He led them from place to place, eventually to the promised land. This was a, a serious offense in that it denied the priests their portion of food, meaning if, if they began sacrificing animals hither and yon, anywhere at any time, then the priests who were depending on these sacrifices for their livelihood uh, would have a, uh, a, a difficult time. So it was a, um, a serious offense in that it denied the priests their portion of food and it was punishable by being cut off from the people, which could mean different things. Uh, 
the elimination of a line of descendants, for example, or uh, excommunication from the community, or uh, execution by the Lord uh, himself. And so this offense was considered as serious as killing a human being. So God was serious about the way that they made sacrifices and where they made their sacrifices. Another observance, uh, eating blood was prohibited. We'll read in uh, Leviticus chapter 17, verses 10 to 12, it says, uh, and any man from the house of Israel or from the aliens who sojourn among them who eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. Therefore I said to the sons of Israel, no person among you may eat blood, nor may any alien who sojourns among you eat blood. So this teaching quickly establishes three purposes. First of all, it repeats and confirms the prohibition against eating blood that had you know, previously been made in Leviticus chapter three and Leviticus chapter seven. Secondly, it gives the reason behind the rule. Life is in the blood and blood is used to atone for sin. You can't, you can't eat it, you can't treat it as food. It, it belongs in the realm of spirituality and sacrifice. And then thirdly, God will himself punish those who violate this important law. The idea being that if you eat the blood, you may forfeit your own lifeblood for doing so. Another observance, wild animals uh, killed by hunters. The uh, Israelites could kill and eat a clean wild animal, but could not eat its blood. So God is making the distinction here. The blood ban was for all animals since blood played the same part in every living creature. In other words, Without the blood, there was no, was no life. Uh, another uh, observance, uh, animals that died from other causes. Again, this refers to the clean category of animals who died from uh, illness or accident, or they were killed by other animals. For the Jew, just touching an animal that had died in these ways made him unclean and he would need to quarantine until dark, bathe, and only then could he return to the camp. The uh, carcass, however, could be sold to a foreigner. So the Bible permits a person to eat meat. New Testament uh, permits a person to eat any type of meat. We read, we read about that in Acts chapter 10 and in Romans chapter 14. The New Testament also permits those who refrain from eating meat. In other words, you, you're free to eat meat if you want, but you're also free to refrain from eating meat. It also makes the distinction between humans. Humans are made in the image of God, Genesis chapter one, verse 27, and animals are created by God, but they're not created in His image. And so there is a difference between the value of a human being and a, uh, an animal, according to the Bible. Sometimes we think, well, that's a no-brainer, but there are some people in this world that actually believe that the life of a human isn't worth more than the life of a, an animal. But the Bible uh, makes that distinction and explains why. Uh, humans are made in the image of God, animals are not. Uh, in the next section of Leviticus, beginning in chapter 18, uh, Moses uh, sets out the, um, the observances and the rules that uh, God gives him concerning uh, forbidden sexual uh, relations. Uh, for Israel uh, to become a holy nation, deviant sexual behavior had to be identified and labeled um, as, uh, as wrong. This chapter can be divided into three parts. The introduction part, uh, in other words, who gave the laws and why. Um, secondly, laws required to obey. And thirdly, a summary and uh, consequences for disobeying the laws against forbidden sexual uh, practices. Uh, 
Uh, you have to understand that the, uh, the people had come from uh, four centuries of being among pagans and they had been used to seeing and perhaps practicing various uh, types of sexual activity uh, that was forbidden, uh, but they, uh, you know, they were immersed in it because they were immersed in a, in a pagan culture. So at this point, uh, God gives them rules uh, to help them differentiate uh, between what was acceptable sexual activity and which was uh, and that which was uh, forbidden. So we read in chapter 18 beginning in verse 1 it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. Uh, you shall not do what is done in the land of Egypt where you lived, nor are you to do what is done in the land of Canaan where I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You are to perform my judgments and keep my statutes to live in accord with them. I am the Lord your God. So you shall keep my statutes and my judgments by which a man may live if he does them. I am the Lord. So here we have the uh, introductory uh, passage. And in the introduction, there is a reminder that the laws about to be given come from God himself and they're given to Moses who will relay them to the people. These laws are part of the uh, ongoing process of transforming these people into the holy people of God. The reward for obeying these are not simply a holier life experience, but also a continuing life experience. And in the passage uh, that uh, we just read, we see uh, a mention, you know, uh, God mentions, you're not to do the things that were done in Egypt and you're not to do the things that they do in the land of Canaan. So the things that he forbids are things that were happening in the society where they li had lived for four centuries and in the society where they were uh, going to go live in the, in the future. So uh, the next section are the details of the uh, prohibitions. First of all, first, uh, sexual relations with relatives were prohibited. Leviticus 18, verse six to 18. This included, and I'm just listing them here, this included a man having sex with his mother, his stepmother or father's wife, his sister or half-sister, his granddaughter, his stepsister, his aunt, his daughter-in-law, his sister-in-law, a woman and her daughter or granddaughter, a woman and her sister while she is living. Now, these are not a complete list of possible incestuous relationships. Uh, it doesn't mention here father and daughter, for example, not mentioned. But this list is representative of the entire issue of incestuous relationships. They were now formally prohibited uh, to do these things for two reasons. First, of course, the negative genetic effects of incest. Uh, we know now, they didn't know then. At that time, they had only the command not to do these things. Today, we know that uh, the genetic effect of, uh, of incest, uh, first, uh, there's twice the risk of early mortality for the, for the child and 10 times the risk of suffering mental retardation or physical deformities. And secondly, there's of course the negative family and social conflicts uh, as the result of uh, incest. And then uh, he gives uh, other sexual relations that are also prohibited in Leviticus 18, 19 to 23. And these uh, include a man having sex with, for example, a woman while she is on her periods. Uh, this had to do with the issue of blood and it rendered one ceremonially unclean. It was also a consideration of love and kindness to the woman while she was indisposed. And also uh, what else was prohibited was sex with a neighbor's wife, repeating the commandment from uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. This was a capital offense for both parties, for both the man and the woman. Another uh, detail, <clears throat> offering a child uh, to the pagan god uh, Molech. Uh, 
This was idolatry and idolatry was considered spiritual adultery. Hence the inclusion of this command in this list. Also sexual relationships with those of the same sex uh, is mentioned. This activity was seen by God as both an abomination, uh, the Hebrew word there meaning something that was disgusting, and also detestable, uh, the other Hebrew word meaning filthy. And so we read about that in Leviticus chapter uh, 20, verse uh, 13. This also, same sex uh, activity, this also was a capital offense. So not all of these prohibitions were carried over to the New Testament. For example, sex with a woman on her period, but uh, that, that idea was not carried over uh, into the New Testament. But homosexual practice is carried over. We read about that in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 and 10. In the New Testament, there are prohibitions uh, against same-sex activity as well. Um, widespread homosexuality, just from a historical perspective, is usually the marker used in the Bible to convey acute moral decay in a society and also a precursor to uh, that society's judgment. For example, Sodom and the cities in the valley surrounding it were uh, active in this particular practice and we see what happened to those cities. The Roman Empire, especially near its end, uh, was uh, guilty of uh, rampant uh, homosexuality and same-sex activity. Uh, and we see uh, Paul condemning this in Romans chapter one, verses 26 and 27. Also prohibited was sexual relationship with an animal, what we call bestiality. This was forbidden for both men and women. It was a practice of the Canaanites who, uh, who drew pictures of their gods mating with animals. This also was a capital offense where both the animal and the person were killed. There were also uh, punishments for disobedience. Uh, the reason and the consequences for these prohibitions were quite simple. The people in the land where he was leading them um, were all guilty of these sorts of sins. And for that reason, God was going to judge them. And he didn't want his people to repeat this behavior and suffer the same consequence. Uh, in the Bible, it says God spewed them out of the land. Okay? It's a poetic way of saying that they would be uh, destroyed. And he was using, uh, doing, using rather the uh, Jewish nation to do the, uh, the punishment or the uh, judgment. Also, 40 years later, God would use his people led by Joshua to enter the land of Canaan and execute his judgment by annihilating the people, the animals, everyone, uh, completely taking over their land, their houses and their cities and destroying uh, the people and the animals. God required his people to be holy in the tabernacle when they came before him in the ritual of worship, but he also required holiness in the secret intimacy of sexual relations as well. He was to be honored in every, in every place. Whether one was a Jew living in the promised land or a New Testament Christian living in America, it is not our country or our society that dictates what is acceptable to God concerning sexual behavior. It's his word that sets the boundaries for what is sexually moral and nothing has changed from the beginning. The ideal that we strive for is one man and one woman in marriage, sharing sexual intimacy in that marriage for life. That's the ideal. I realize that we fall short of that ideal from time to time in various ways, but that remains the ideal. And even if in our nation, uh, this nation or other nation, uh, uh, politicians change the laws and uh, you know, uh, make special laws uh, uh, advocating for uh, different types of sexual relationships, uh, those are man's laws. And as Christians, uh, we're, not, uh, uh, we're not subject to man's laws when man's laws uh, conflict with God's laws. We always have to remain uh, faithful to God's laws. Uh, 
All right, so there are some details of prohibitions, especially concerning sexual activities. There are also social regulations for God's people that are mentioned uh, in Leviticus chapter 19, and we'll read some of those. We begin in Leviticus uh, 19 verse 18. It says, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So, so far in this book, God has given the people regulations dealing with their most important individual relationship, which was with God Himself. The way to approach and to worship Him, uh, the building of the place where the worship was to take place, the uh, sacrificial system and priests who would offer sacrifice on their behalf, and maintaining uh, holiness by discerning what was clean from what was unclean. In chapter 18, we learn about how to maintain and honor uh, the next important relationship in life, which is with one's spouse. Uh, next to our relationship with God, our relationship with our spouse is uh, a priority. Uh, these are made up of laws prohibiting various sexual practices outside of marriage, uh, promoting fidelity and the blessings that come with a unified marriage. And so in chapter 19, God provides what seems like a variety of rules and regulations, but when taken together, they serve to guide His people in their relationship with their neighbors. So at the beginning of the book, we have the things we need to do in our relationship with God, and then in the middle section, the things we need to, well, not do to make sure that we maintain a right relationship with our spouse. And now as we move into the, you know, the latter chapters, God gives rules uh, in how we are to uh, maintain good relations with our neighbors. Therefore, all relationships are addressed in order to provide peace and satisfaction with God, with our marriage partner, and with our neighbor. And so the introduction in chapter 19, verses one and two is, uh, is as follows. It says, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to all the congregation of the sons of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And so as, as God has done before, He states the source of the laws. And the source of the laws that He gives are Himself, which give the laws credibility. If the law comes from God, it comes from the highest authority. That's, that's the point that He makes every time He gives a new set of laws, a new set of instructions to, uh, to Moses. He also states the purpose of keeping these laws in order to become and maintain holiness as a people of God. This chapter can be divided into three parts. First, keeping all of God's commandments, verses three to 10, the necessity of doing that. Second, loving one's fellow man, verses 11 to 18. And thirdly, maintaining the nation's distinctiveness, very important, verses 19 to 37. So we begin with, uh, uh, keeping all of God's commands. Not all of God's commands were listed, but several are described to represent the whole. In other words, what He gives is a sampling of His commands. And so we have, uh, you know, in these verses, uh, verse three to 10 in chapter 19, various commands given. For example, uh, they were to honor parents, verse three. Uh, keep the Sabbath day, verse three. Do not worship idols, verse four. Don't make idols, verse four. Um, follow the rules concerning the peace offering, verses five to eight. This was a reminder that the meat from this sacrifice could not be eaten beyond the second day after it was sacrificed. Some apparently were hoarding meat not trusting that God would provide beyond, you know, beyond the, the day they would make that sacrifice. Next, um, a, a, a command to uh, leave uh, your fields, uh, in other words, while you were harvesting, leave your fields after only one pass, so others would um, have something left uh, 
uh, to collect, the gleaners and the poor. Uh, uh, the, uh, it, it was a particular Jewish custom to differentiate themselves and their customs from other nations. Other nations would pass through their fields two and three times to make sure they collected every last bit of, of harvest. And God tells the Jews, you're not to be like that. You'll, go, you'll make one pass and that's it. Uh, whatever is left over, leave for the poor and the gleaners and so on and so forth. Then he gives a set of, um, a set of rules uh, concerning uh, the loving of one's fellow man in verses 11 to 18. Again, these laws dealt with how God's people were to deal with their neighbors, fellow human beings. So you have, uh, first of all, not to steal from others, verse 11. Don't deal falsely or lie to others, verse 11. Don't swear falsely by God's name, verse 12. Don't oppress others, in other words, don't enslave other people, verse 13. Don't rob or withhold wages, verse 13. Withholding wages was a form of oppression or theft. Um, number six, don't take advantage of the handicap, verse 14. Number seven, render a fair judgment. In other words, don't play favorites uh, you know, based on your feelings or based on you know, one is a relative and the other one is not a relative and you make a, uh, you make a, a judgment that is not, uh, that is not fair. Uh, no gossip or slander, verse 16. Don't endanger your neighbor with gossip or careless actions, verse 16. Don't resent or hold a grudge against another, verse 17. You can correct or reprove another person, but not in such a way that you sin in doing so. In other words, uh, no verbal attack uh, is uh, tolerated. And then no revenge, uh, but rather love your neighbor as yourself, verse 18. So I want you to note that each command reflects one of the original 10 commandments and each is punctuated with the words, I am the Lord. And uh, this is repeated uh, over and over again for emphasis and authority. These are not Moses' commands, these are the Lord's commands. Another set of directions, this time for maintaining the nation's distinctiveness in Leviticus 19, 19 to 37. These various rules will highlight Israel's distinct nature as God's holy people. They're separate in rule, they're separate in lifestyle from the nations around them. So first, no mixing of cattle, no mixing of seed or materials, verse 19. Uh, this could have been done uh, to highlight that the nation of Israel was not to mix with other nations. Secondly, sexual sins needed to be atoned for, verses 20 to 22. A man having sex with another man's slave girl was not a capital offense, but still had to be acknowledged and properly atoned for at the tabernacle. Uh, there needed to be a uh, public confession. You just couldn't do what you wanted to do and just hush things up. You had to come forward and acknowledge your wrong. Number three, rules for planting trees for food. Uh, and these were rules, of course, that were given um, uh, for the time that they would be in the promised land. Uh, and, and this rule here about planting trees was given to demonstrate their holiness by their absolute faith in God that they would allow their fruit trees to mature for three years without picking a harvest. And then they would offer the first edible crop on the fourth year to God and then only eat of the crop on the fifth year's harvest. This showed their reliance on God to provide in the meantime. Another rule, Jews were forbidden to partake in the pagan and social slash religious customs of their neighbors. For example, they were not to eat meat without first draining the blood of the animal, going back to the no eating of blood rule. Um, they were not to practice divination or soothsaying to learn the will of their gods. Uh, the Jews had God's word to guide them. Now uh, divination, divination was uh, the attempt of knowing the will of the gods 
using various methods, cards, incantations, palm reading, that's divination, to guess, to divine. And sooth saying was knowing the future by reading the stars or perhaps examining animal organs. Uh, the Babylonians would read uh, livers from, from animals uh, as a way of uh, determining what would take place in the future. God is saying to them, uh, these practices are detestable, don't, don't do this. Also, uh, they were not to cut their beards in certain ways to identify which pagan god they worshiped. Uh, they were not to make cuts on their bodies to entreat the help from the gods or the dead. You know, the prophets of Baal would cut themselves as a way of showing their uh, devotion to Baal and asking him to uh, answer, their, uh, answer their prayers. And also they were not to uh, mark their bodies with tattoos as a way to show uh, their pagan religiosity. Obviously today people don't wear tattoos uh, as a, a way to identify with uh, a pagan religion, mostly decorative today. But in that time, tattoos were connected uh, to um, uh, idolatry and other pagan practices. So Jews showed their distinct religious beliefs with holy behavior and a faithful practice of their religion. They, they had rules about their religion and, and God was saying, just follow your religion, follow the rules for your religion. Don't, don't you know, incorporate or practice the rules uh, that are taking place or that are there for other religions uh, because uh, they were unique and they were surrounded by people who had other beliefs and other uh, religious practices. Uh, number five, um, uh, it was forbidden to sell uh, one's daughters into harlotry uh, for them to become temple prostitutes, which was a, a common custom among pagans. Sons were valuable and uh, could generate income that daughters could not. And so a man with many uh, unmarried daughters might be tempted to monetize some of them uh, by selling them into, uh, into prostitution. Next rule, keep the Sabbath and maintain the place of worship. This would be more difficult once settled in the promised land and the activities of normal life would take over. While they're wandering in the desert, that's the only thing they have to do. They're not planting, they're not harvesting, they're not, uh, you know, they're not uh, working their uh, livestock or anything like that. Uh, their main task was uh, obeying God's commands. Uh, and, 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 and making sure that they remained holy and ceremonially clean. But once they got into the promised land, you know, regular life would take over. They, they were going to build houses and, and corrals and so on and so forth, get, grow their herds, uh, plant a crop. And so God says, you know, when, when you get there, make sure you maintain um, your uh, religious uh, practice. Um, also, um, uh, number seven, mediums and spiritists were forbidden. They already had God's word and they had God's priests uh, to guide them in their spiritual life. So they were not to tolerate any of these among them. Number eight, honor and care for the elderly, verse 32. Number nine, love the strangers, you know, aliens, immigrants in your land. They were once themselves strangers in Egypt and that nation took advantage of them. Uh, God is saying, don't do, don't do like they did. You, you, you be different in your treatment of the alien that's among you. Number 10, be honest in business dealings with all people, verse 35 and six. Number 11 is a summary statement. All the laws given are God's laws, not man's laws. They were to obey because he was the Lord and he was the one giving the commands. By obeying these commands, the Jews witnessed two things. One, their God was a God of love and justice and righteousness, and this could be seen in what he had done for his people as well as in the commands that he gave them to follow. They were righteous things. And secondly, his people were a reflection of the God that they worship. 
and this was seen in the holy way that they lived. They were different, but they were different in a good way uh, than all the nations around them. The next section in uh, Leviticus chapter 20 uh, detail the penalties for breaking uh, God's laws. Chapters uh, 18 and 19 contain various laws God gave to His people. Chapter 20 focuses on the consequences of violating these laws. In a secular society, all crimes might be considered as sins of one kind or another, but not all sins were crimes. For example, adultery is a sin, but it's not seen as a crime. However, in a theocracy like Israel, the only laws that existed were God's laws. So all sins were crimes and therefore subject to punishment or making atonement. And all crimes were sins. The sins in chapter 20 are listed on a case basis and divided into two categories. Sins of a capital nature requiring the death penalty and then less serious sins that had lesser uh, punishments. And so we begin with, uh, first of all, uh, offering human sacrifice to, uh, to uh, Molech, uh, verses one to five. This action uh, disgraced both God and his sanctuary in that an innocent human life was offered to a false God uh, in the way that animals were offered to the true God. Punishment was death by the people, by stoning. And if the people were unwilling, then God would carry out the punishment himself. The people would also be punished for their refusal to carry out the death sentence, if that's what took place. Uh, then uh, there's a list of other capital crimes in verses six to 16. For example, consulting mediums or spiritists. This was spiritual adultery since Israel belonged to God and he was her defender, provider and guide. Also uh, cursing one's parents, adultery, incest, and here they mention with a stepmother or daughter-in-law, uh, practicing homosexuality. I, I, I want you to notice it says practicing homosexuality. Uh, having same sex feelings is not a sin. It's the acting out of those feelings which is the sin. Why it says even way back in, in, in Leviticus, you know, thousands of years ago, practicing homosexuality was the sin. Uh, having sex with a woman and her mother was a sin, a crime, and then practicing bestiality. Then you had crimes that called for, these, these by the way were all capital crimes, all right? Then you had crimes uh, calling for other types of punishment in verses 17 to 21. Non-capital crimes were punished by public disgrace and or banishment, as well as not having descendants or perhaps other punishments from God. So a list of these, sex with a sister or half sister, sex with a woman during her period, sex with an aunt, sex with a sister-in-law, the prohibitions against sex with an aunt or sister-in-law extended to marriage between these related people. The punishment, if they married, was that they would be childless. In other words, they wouldn't have any uh, descendants. Again, not a teaching for every possible breach of God's laws, but a sample to use in judging uh, these types of actions and comparatively uh, similar cases. They had to use their knowledge of God's laws as well as personal judgment uh, on each case, but they had enough of you know, uh, precedence, if you wish, enough examples in order to uh, make a judgment uh, for a situation that wasn't necessarily um, spelled out, uh, you know, they did, that they didn't have a direct command for. They had plenty of examples to go by. Um, the next section is a, a summary and exhor uh, exhortation, verses 22 to seven. The chapter on laws and punishments concludes with an exhortation to the people to be careful, to keep all of God's laws and the reason why they should. Um, uh, 
and, and the reason why they should was to fulfill their unique role as God's holy nation. It always comes back to that. You know, God is, a, is holy and His people are to be holy and what we're looking at are the details, the nuts and bolts of how they were to uh, obtain and then maintain that holiness. So there were three responsibilities they had to meet in order to reach their goal of staying in the promised land as a holy nation. First, keep all the commands, verse 22. Second, avoid the behavior of the pagan nations. You're different. I've given you laws, I've given you commands, I've given you a worship system, uh, and if you follow these things, you will automatically become different than the nations around you. Well, maintain these things and you will maintain your distinctiveness. And then thirdly, make the distinction between clean and unclean, something that had already uh, been uh, given to them. God's exhortation in verses uh, 26 and 27, uh, the laws that He gave them, if obeyed, would guarantee that they would truly become a holy nation and for this reason they would experience a special relationship with God. He finishes by reminding them once again the inherent danger of consulting any other source, mediums, spiritists, in order to know things in the spirit world, things that only God could know or reveal. The damage to their spiritual life would be great uh, he says they'd be plunged back into the darkness and the penalty to their physical life would also be great and that would be death. And so chapter 20 reveals uh, which uh, crime or sin and punishment uh, and deals with three uh, main ideas as we finish up. Um, first of all, uh, crime or sin always leads to punishment. There's something you know, that hasn't changed, even today. You know, sin always leads eventually to punishment. The wage of sin is death, right? Romans 6, 23. Secondly, God fits the punishment to the sin or to the crime. In other words, God is just. And thirdly, the punishment for sin doesn't have to be inevitable. God also provides a way for sins to be forgiven. In those days, they had the sacrificial system. Today, we have the cross of Christ. God provides a way for sins to be forgiven. Why? Because He knows that people are weak and sinful uh, and, they, and they fail and many times uh, in keeping His laws. Even when they want to, even when their heart's desire is to keep his laws and to do the things that he desires, they still fail at doing this. And so he provides you know, that uh, fail safe, which is a method to obtain uh, forgiveness. In that day and time, it was the sacrificial system. In our day, it's the cross of Christ and faith in him uh, uh, expressed in repentance and baptism that uh, washes away uh, our sins. All right. Well, that's it for uh, chapter, uh, or rather lesson number 12. Uh, a long reading assignment ahead of you, uh, chapters 21 to 27. That, that's, there's a lot of material there. A lot of, them, a lot of it are lists and things. We're going to try to finish that next time uh, we meet. But I encourage you to read 21 to 27 simply because we, we certainly will not have time to read a lot of that. Uh, I'll be commenting on uh, different sections of um, that part of Leviticus. Uh, so that's the end of our lesson for this time. Thank you for your attention. I pray that God bless you and I look forward to seeing you the next time. Bye-bye.